Gentile church has played a significant part in downgrading the status of the true descendants of Israel. Based on their interpretation of New Testament scripture, the old had to die in order to make way for the new and improved Israel of God. In essence, the church is saying that Israel's right to her title and covenants have been revoked. Interestingly, this may explain why Christianity places more emphasis on the New Testament as opposed to the Old. In this fourth session of the series, When Did the Christians Replace Israel? We're going to trace the history of replacement theology and see how the church used this new doctrine to erase Israel. So, family, I'm hoping to fill in some gaps for us as we continue to expose this false doctrine that says that the Most High is done with his people and he replaced them with the Gentile church. And I'm using the term Gentile church for a reason. And you'll understand as I dig into this lesson. But what we want to know is how did the called out assembly made up of Israelites morph into what is known today as the religion of Christianity founded by the Romans, the very ones who put Messiah to death and persecuted the early believers. So we have to begin with some of the writings of the early church fathers. And when I say church fathers, I'm not talking about the apostles, no. In Catholicism, in Christianity, the church fathers are those folks recognized by the Catholic Church. They're credited with documenting and writing early church history. Let's look at some of the names. Ignatius of Antioch, Parlicop, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius. You have Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Hippolytus, Cyprian of Carthage, Dionysius, they call it Dionysius the Great, Peter of Alexandria, Lactinius, Alexander of Alexandria, Eusebius, and we're going to talk about uh, him specifically today, and Cyril of Jerusalem, Augustine, and the one known as Leo the Great. I'll begin by highlighting some information from the book Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History, the complete and unabridged version. And there is a lot of reading, but I really believe that this is important information we need to understand as we try to put the pieces of the puzzle together concerning our history. Now, as I said, I'm going to focus on Eusebius quite a bit in this session because he's considered one of the main church fathers in regards to the history of the church and its foundation. But there are some things you need to know about him. You need to understand that in his writing, when he says church, he's talking about the Catholic church. Eusebius was a Catholic. So most of these historians and church fathers are providing information from the perspective of the Catholic Church. And there are some key phrases they use to let you know that they are presenting information from that perspective. So I'll share some information from this article called The Problem of Eusebius. And this was written by uh, Everett Ferguson and published in Christian History. It says Eusebius had many defects, both as a writer and as a historian. He assumed inaccurately that the early church looked just like the church he knew. He displayed no sense of doctrinal or institutional development, especially in the Latin West, a region about which he knew little. Eusebius can also be accused of whitewashing what he did know as he introduced accounts of persecution in his day. He stated that he was including only what would be profitable. So a lot of the persecution he's describing, a lot of these things happen to our people, the Israelites. Yes, there may have been 
some Gentile converts included in that. But for the most part, these persecutions were happening to our people. It also says other complaints about Eusebius include his inattention to coherent narrative, his occasionally careless use of sources, and of course his belief that Christianity and the Roman state belong together. And this is true. This is his premise. You'll see that he uses the word church synonymously with the called out believers founded by Messiah. He lumps the two together because the Catholic Church wants the world to believe that Messiah founded Catholicism, the religion. He did not. Let's keep going. So it says Eusebius was not only a recorder of history, but one of the key players at a significant turning point for the church. His era was marked by the great persecution under Diocletian and his co-rulers, the conversion of Emperor Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. So Eusebius is the one who portrayed this great conversion of Constantine to Christianity because they were trying to strengthen this church and um, thinking that it would put an end to the persecution. He's the one who described Constantine as the model Christian. Meanwhile, Constantine was still practicing paganism. Let's go on. It says Eusebius's moderate stance on Arianism, a Christology denounced as heresy at Nicaea, earned him temporary excommunication by a synod at Antioch in 324 or 325. But the zealous support of Constantine put the biggest blot on his legacy. Expounded in the celebratory life of Constantine, this odd admiration also appears at the end of the church history, where to be fair, it makes some sense. So it says Eusebius had lived through terrible persecution. Constantine's conversion to Christianity promised to end such horrors and begin an era unprecedented church strength. So Eusebius's support for the redeem regime, regime was a logical, albeit naive, reaction. So he enjoyed Constantine's um, support and he was brought in as the family's chronicler. He also became Bishop of Caesarea. So I wanted you to have this background about him as I highlight some of his writings so that you can see how we went from having assemblies under the leadership of Israelites to these Gentile bishops. All right, so listen as he gives his historical account. This is the bishops of Jerusalem from the age of our Savior to the period under consideration. So he says, the chronology of the bishops of Jerusalem I have nowhere found preserved in writing, for tradition says that they, are, they were all short-lived. But I have learned this much from writings, that until the siege of the Jews, which took place under Adrian, or Hadrian, some says, there were 15 bishops in succession there, all of whom, don't miss this, all of whom are said to have been of Hebrew descent and to have received the knowledge of Christ in purity so that they were approved, listen, by those who were able to judge of such matters and were deemed worthy of the episcopate. Listen to this part. For their whole church consisted then of believing Hebrews who continued from the days of the apostles until the siege which took place at this time in which siege the Jews, talking about the Hebrew Israelites, having again rebelled against the Romans, were conquered after severe battles. He goes on to say, 
but since the bishops of the circumcision cease, so after they died, he says, at this time, it is proper to give here a list of their names from the beginning. So he lists them out beginning with James, the brother of Messiah. But listen to what he says. He says, these are the bishops of Jerusalem that lived between the age of the apostles and the time referred to all of them belonging to the circumcision. So he goes on and he says, as the rebellion of the Jews at this time grew much more serious, Rufus, governor of Judea, after an auxiliary force had been sent him by the emperor using their madness as a pretext, proceeded against them without mercy and destroyed indiscriminately thousands of men and women and children, the Hebrew Israelites and in accordance with the laws of war, reduced their country to a state of complete subjection. So this siege that he's referring to wiped out a lot of the leaders. It basically created a vacuum of leadership. And it's during this time that the Gentile converts began moving into roles as bishops. You decide whether or not it was a coup or not. So it says the leader of the Jews at this time or the leader of the Jews at this time was a man by the name of Bar Kokiba, which signifies a star, who possessed the character of a robber and a murderer, but nevertheless, relying upon his name, boasted to them as if they were slaves, that he possessed wonderful powers, and he could pretend that he was a star that had come down to them out of heaven to bring them light in the midst of their misfortunes. The war raged most fiercely in the 18th year of Adrian at the city of Bythara, which was a very secure fortress situated not far from Jerusalem. When the siege had lasted a long time and the rebels had been driven to the last extremity by hunger and thirst, and the instigator of the rebellion had suffered his just punishment, the whole nation, don't miss this, the whole nation was prohibited from this time on by a decree and by the commands of Adrian from ever going up to the country about Jerusalem. For the emperor gave orders that they should not even see from a distance the land of their fathers. Hmm. So it goes on, and thus, when the city had been emptied, here's the vacuum, when the city had been emptied of the Jewish nation, again, we're using that word loosely here, and had suffered the total destruction of its ancient inhabitants, it was colonized by a different race. Did you catch that? When the city had been emptied of the ancient inhabitants, it was colonized by a different race. And the Roman city, which subsequently arose, changed its name. <laughs> so they changed the name and started calling it a Elia in honor of the emperor, Adrian. And as the church there was now composed of Gentiles, as the church there was now composed of Gentiles, the first one to assume the government of it after the bishops of the circumcision was Marcus. Now let's look at this timeline and you're going to see how the Gentile church usurped the authority of the nation of Israel and installed itself as the priests and kings in the earth. So these events occurred after the death and resurrection of Messiah. You have the foundation that he set in place for this called out assembly of believers known as people of the way. And they are continuing on with the mission that he gave to them. So by the 30s, Paul of Tarsus is now a believer 
and Peter ministers to Cornelius and it says this event marks the beginning of the missionizing to the Gentiles. By the 40s, you see the full-on persecution of the believers in Jerusalem under Herod Agrippa, and many of them escape to Antioch. But then by the 50s, they set the Council of Jerusalem, or they came together at the Council of Jerusalem, to talk about the rules and guidelines that pertain to the Gentile converts and basically determined that they did not have to observe all of the Mosaic laws. By the 60s, you see the persecution against our people increase dramatically. Uh, Nero by this time has blamed them for doing things that they did not do. So a lot of our people died during this era and during this time also Peter is martyred and they install Linus as Pope and for those of you who do not know the story the Roman Catholic Church says that Messiah gave the keys to the church to Peter and Peter became the first Roman Catholic Pope. And after him began a succession of Gentile Popes. So after Peter was killed by the Romans, they installed this Pope called Linus. I did a video called the first Pope Peter meet the man called Simon. I really encourage you to go back and watch that video because I identify who the first Pope Peter was. It was not the Apostle Peter. The link is in the top right. Again, I really encourage you to go back and watch that because it will clarify a lot of things for you. So again, we're talking about the mid-60s now. Peter has now been killed. By 69, you have the fall of Jerusalem happening, the temple is destroyed, etc. Tacitus is saying that over 600,000 were slaughtered during this siege. And Josephus actually says it was more like a million. So by the 70s, you have now have these popes installed by the Roman Catholic Church. And as I said, this Pope named Linus supposedly took over after Peter. And it says all the ancient records of the Roman bishops, which have been handed down to us by Saint Arrhenius, Julius Africanus, Hippolytus, Eusebius, also the Liberian catalog of 354, place the name of Linus directly after that of the Prince of the Apostles, Saint Peter. So you want to take a guess as to where Linus came from? His birthplace was Italy. Now what do you already know about Italy and Esau Edom? So after the Israelites were slaughtered and scattered, the Roman Catholic Church gained full control of the rights that belonged to Israel. And the grand deception really kicked in and the Roman Catholic Church began the process of synchronizing it with paganism. The doctrine of demons preached by Simon Magus, Menander, and others took hold and really began to shape the religion now known as Christianity. So let's see what else Eusebius says. So he talks about, he says, there has come down to us a most powerful refutation of Basilides by Agrippa Castor, one of the most renowned writers of that day, which shows the terrible imposture of the man. While exposing his mysteries, he says that Basilides wrote 24 books upon the gospel and he invented prophets for himself named Barcabas and Barkoff and others that had no existence and that he gave them barbarous names in order to amaze 
those who marvel at such things, that he taught also that the eating of meat offered to idols and the unguarded renunciation of the faith in times of persecution were matters of indifference, and that he enjoined upon his followers, like Pythagoras, a silence of five years. So he says other similar things, like the above mentioned, started happening. And he goes on to say that Irenaeus also writes that Carpocrates was a contemporary of these men and that he was the father of another heresy called the heresy of the Gnostics, who did not wish to transmit any longer the magic arts of Simon, talking about Simon Magnus, Magus, as that one who had done in secret but openly for they boasted as of something great of love potions that were carefully prepared by them and of certain demons that sent them dreams and lent them their protection and of other similar agencies. And in accordance with these things, they taught that it was necessary for those who wish to enter fully into their mysteries. What do you think they're talking about? <laughs> or rather into their abominations to practice all the worst kinds of wickedness. This is their covenant with the fallen angels. We talked about that already. It says on the ground that they could escape the cosmic powers as they call them in no other way than by discharging their obligations to them all by infamous conduct. So he says, thus it came to pass that the malignant demon making use of these ministers on the one hand enslaved those that were so pitiably led astray by them to their own destruction. So they were deceiving people with the doctrine. And it says, while on the other hand, he furnished to the unbelieving heathen abundant opportunities for slandering the divine word inasmuch as the reputation of these men brought infamy upon the whole race of Christians. Let's keep going. Now, one of the first major controversies that really proved that this church created by Rome was no longer following the ways of the apostles was the Easter controversy. And why was this important? Because this was a Roman holy day. It had nothing whatsoever to do with Messiah's death and resurrection. So this comes from the Church of God International. It says, how was Passover replaced by Easter and who did it? This is when reviewing the historical record of the Passover Easter controversy, it is undeniable that the early New Testament church did not observe Easter. They continued observing Passover. So I'll go on. It says the first Christians continued the observance of the Jewish or Yah's festivals, though in a new spirit as commemorations of events which those festivals had foreshadowed. In addition, we are informed neither the apostles, therefore, nor the gospels have anywhere imposed Easter. When you see that word in your Bible, it was added. That word was not in the original translation. It says the Savior and his apostles have enjoined us by no law to keep this feast Easter and that the observance originated not by legislation of the apostles, but as a custom, the facts themselves indicate. So whose custom was it? Rome. It goes on to say, assuredly, we must first understand the contention between the Western congregations led by Rome and the Eastern Asiatic congregations. This debate intensified during the second century and is historically known as the Quarto Deciman controversy. So it simply means a term indicating the 14th. 
and what the ecclesiastical record of the second second century reveals is that there was a major controversy over this because it concerned the change from the 14th as in Passover to Easter and they were incorporating all of its pagan connections and associations with this. So it came to a head when Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who was personally taught by John the Apostle, faced off with Anicetus, the preeminent Bishop of Rome in about 95 AD. So by 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, Constantine himself writes to the churches saying that at this meeting, the question concerning the most holy day of Easter was discussed and it was resolved by the united judgment of all present. Now, who do you think was in attendance? It says that this feast ought to be kept by all and in every place on one and the same day. Easter Sunday and that is why Easter is always on a Sunday because they are giving honor to the Sun God and he goes on he says and first of all it has appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast we should follow the practice of the Jews in other words we don't care what they said <laughs> yeah so he says, and I myself have undertaken that this decision should meet with the approval of your sagacity in the hope that your wisdoms will gladly admit that practice which is observed Easter Sunday at once in the city of Rome and in Africa, throughout Italy and Egypt with entire unity of judgment. But the apostles warned of this, you all. In 1 John 1, 2, 18 through 20, it says, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us. This doctrine of demons was initiated when the apostles were still alive. It says, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Again, this is why it's so important for us to be led by the spirit so that we can know how to rightly divide look at what paul says in ephesians 2 19 through 22 now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of yah and are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets this was supposed to be the foundational message the message that came from messiah there should not have been an emperor of Rome who has the audacity to implement doctrine in the church. He says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of Yah through the Spirit. The article goes on to say that Irenaeus states that St. Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who like the other Asiatics kept Easter on the 14th day of the moon, which is really the Passover, whatever day of the week that might be, following there in the tradition which he, Polycarp, claimed to have derived from St. John the Apostle. So Again, this is showing that those apostles kept the feast days, but could not be persuaded by Pope Anicetus to relinquish his quarter decimal observance. The question thus debated was therefore primarily whether Easter was to be kept on a Sunday 
or whether Christians should observe the holy day of the Jews. Those who kept Easter with the Jews were called quarto decimans. So I guess you can see who won that battle, right? <laughs> Now we're going to look at the thought process and some quotes from the religious leaders that laid the foundation for this heretical doctrine. We'll begin with Marcion, and you need to know about this guy because apparently he got a lot of this started. He was the son of a Catholic bishop. No surprise there, right? He taught that the Old Testament should be rejected because they belonged to an inferior God. He basically hated the God of the Old Testament. So let's see what, what this article says. It says he eventually taught that the God of the Old Testament was not the true God, but rather that the true and higher God had been revealed only with Jesus Christ. He therefore rejected the theology of the Old Testament. Marcion wrote the antithesis to show the differences between the God of the Old Testament and the true God. Marcion was excommunicated by the church at Rome around 144 AD, but he succeeded in establishing churches of his own to rival the Orthodox Church for the next two centuries. Continuing on, it says Marcion is often credited as being first to establish an explicit canon. Marcion's canon consisted of the gospel or the gospel of the Lord and 10 epistles of Paul, not including the pastorals. Marcion, Marcion's gospel was apparently a truncated version of Luke with extraneous content underpinning Marcion's theology. So basically he put together a Bible that only had Luke's edited gospel and all 10 of Paul's epistle because he believed that Paul was the only apostle that people should read. So let's continue. It says that just as Marcion's canon stimulated the more precise defining of the New Testament canon by the Catholic Church, not to supersede but to supplement the canon of the Old Testament, so more generally, Marcion's teaching led the Catholic Church to define its faith more carefully in terms calculated to exclude a Marcionite interpretation. So let's continue. Now let's read an excerpt from this article from Brigham Young University entitled A New Testament History, Culture, and Society, a background to the text of the New Testament. So it says Marcion was a wealthy Christian ship owner. Are your bells ringing? From Asia Minor who moved to Rome and immediately became an influential part of the Christian cause, in part through a generous donation of money that he made to the Roman church. By AD 144, however, he appears to have been expelled from his congregation and his financial offerings were allegedly returned to him. Marcion's expulsion, it seems, was connected to his position on a number of theological issues. In a book that he entitled Antithesis, Marcion made the case that the God of the Jewish scriptures, the creator of this material realm, was not the same God as the God of Jesus. For whereas the God of the Jewish scriptures was wrathful, the God of Jesus was merciful and forgiving, whereas the God of Jewish scripture ordered the destruction of entire populations of people. The God of Jesus instructed his disciples to love one another or to love one's enemies. Marcion, in effect, was proposing the existence of not one God, but two a lower God as depicted in the Old Testament, and that was worshiped by the Jews, and a higher God as revealed 
by the teachings of Jesus to whom, to whom true Christians devoted themselves. You all, it's impossible for you not to see the connection of this heresy to this Christian God of love idea. We just have to love everybody. But oh, the hypocrisy of it all. This God was invented to make European Christians feel good about themselves and their atrocities. They don't want to acknowledge that the one true God, the Most High, is good, but he's also just. So can you see where this weak, effeminate, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus came from? It was created out of this replacement theology doctrine. Let's keep going. So it says, Christianity then for Marcion entailed abandoning the lesser deity of Judaism, including renouncing the Old Testament and worshiping the true God that had sent Jesus to this material realm. Marcion's message and evangel even evangelizing activities were profoundly influential, attracting large numbers of adherents throughout the empire, especially in Asia Minor. So there is no way that people in their right minds can think that the Catholic Church that's responsible for the death and destruction around the world of believers can be a godly church or that this nation that engaged in such horrible atrocities can be a Christian nation unless your definition of what it means to be a Christian is not the same as theirs. And I've already covered that, so I'm not going to go into it here, but I will refer you to the playlist called Deception in the Church. So let's look at this from the Catholic Exchange entitled How the Church is the New Israel. It says the Catholic Church has traditionally understood itself to be the New Israel. Just as Israel was God's people in the Old Testament, the church is his people now. And to many in our culture, this sounds extremely arrogant and possibly even anti-Semitic. It seems like we're saying that God has rejected the Jews and chosen a new people to replace them. However, that couldn't be further from the truth. With St. Paul, the church affirms that God has not rejected his people from the Old Testament. And the way we understand our position as the new Israel involves a lot more nuance than simply saying that the church has replaced the Jews in God's eyes. So what exactly does this mean? How exactly can we say that we are the new Israel without disparaging the old Israel? So it goes on to say that God may have separated the Israelites from their neighbors in the past. He did not want them to remain that way forever. No, his ultimate goal was for the rest of the world to one day join them and become part of his people too. He wanted Israel to grow to encompass the entire human race and become a multi-ethnic and multinational family that worshiped him and lived in accordance with his law. And today, we call that family the church. As St. Paul explains, Israel is like a tree. The Jews of Jesus' day as ethnic Israelites were all natural branches in this tree. And any Gentiles or non-Jews who join the church are like branches that are cut off from other trees and grafted into Israel. On the flip side, the Jews who rejected Jesus were cut off from their own family tree. Note that they are now saying all of them instead of saying the northern tribes. Judah was not cut off. As a result, we can see that the church doesn't simply replace Israel. Rather, in a very real sense, the church is Israel. It is 
the multi-ethnic and multinational family made up of both Jews and Gentiles that the Old Testament prophets always said Israel would one day become. Don't miss this part. As it's given that the church truly is Israel, what practical consequences does this have for our spiritual lives? What difference does it make that we are God's people just like the ethnic Israelites were in the Old Testament? In a nutshell, it means that we have inherited the vocation of ancient Israel. In the Old Testament, God said that he chose Israel to be his own possession among all peoples. <laughs> so they say, now this description of Israel's vocation may seem rather opaque to us 21st century Americans, but it would have made perfect sense to its original audience. So he says, the key is that the Israelites were supposed to be God's priests in the midst of the nations. We normally think of priests as people who celebrate mass and run parishes, but the office is actually much broader than that. A priest is essentially someone who mediates between God and humanity. He stands before God as a representative of the people and before the people as a representative of God. More specifically, in, an, in ancient Israel, priests taught the people God's laws and blessed them. So that's what the Israelites were supposed to do. They were supposed to teach the surrounding nations God's laws and impart his blessing to them. In other words, they were supposed to evangelize the rest of mankind and bring them back to the worship of the one true God. He goes on to say, and as the new Israel, we now have the same vocation in fact the New Testament describes the church in a way that calls to mind what God said about Israel in Exodus. But you are a chosen race, race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Is the Catholic Church a nation? God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just as Israel was God's own possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, so too is the church a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Furthermore, this verse even tells us what this means. Just like the Israel, Israelites in the Old Testament, Christians today are God's priests in the midst of the human race in order to declare the wonderful deeds of God. We're supposed to ev ev evangelize the rest of mankind and bring them back to the worship of the one true God. Let's read some of this. It's the so-called letter to Diognetus, its early Christian fathers, and this is by Cyril C. Richardson. So I want you to hear how they speak of Israel's beliefs and cultures as if it were some type of embarrassing artifact of an archaic past. Listen to this. It says, as for Jewish taboos with respect to food, along with their superstition about the Sabbath, their bragging about circumcision and their hypocrisy about fast days and new moons, I hardly think that you need to be told by me that all these things are ridiculous and not worth arguing about. How can it be anything but godlessness? that makes men accept some of the things made by God for man's use as created good and reject other things as useless and superfluous. And is it not impious to pretend that God forbids a good deed on the Sabbath day? And are they not asking for ridicule when they boast of the mutilation of the flesh as a sign of their choice? by God, as if for this reason they were especially by, beloved by him. Again, when they constantly gaze at the stars and watch the new moon in order to observe months and days with scrupulous care and to distinguish 
the changes of the seasons which God has ordained in order to cater to their own whims, making some into festivals and others into times of mourning. Who could call this evidence of devotion rather than of folly? All this being so, I think that you have learned enough to see that Christians are right in holding themselves aloof from the aimlessness and trickery of Greeks and Jews alike, and from the officiousness and noisy conceit of the Jews. But as far as the mystery of the Christian's own religion is concerned, I hope you caught that. You cannot expect to learn that from man. And he's not finished. He begins boasting that the first century Gentile Christians were superior to Israel. So he's, I'm just going to pick up in the middle part. He's talking about Christians. He says, they share their board with each other, but not their marriage bed. It is true that they are in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their own lives, they go far beyond what the laws require. They love all men. Now, you all. Anyway, and by all men are persecuted. They are unknown and still they are condemned. They are put to death and yet they are brought to life. They are poor and yet they make many rich. <laughs> hmm. They are completely destitute and yet they enjoy complete abundance. They are dishonored and in their very dishonor are glorified. They are defamed and are vindicated. They are reviled, and yet they bless. When they are affronted, they still pay due respect. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers, undergoing punishment. They rejoice because they are brought to life. They are treated by the Jews as foreigners and enemies and are hunted down by the Greeks. And all the time, those who hate them find it impossible to justify their enmity. So they believed that this exclusive status that was previously given to Israel was now theirs. And they created this replacement doctrine to elevate their significance in Yah's sight. They didn't want some of the bread. They wanted the entire loaf. So we will pick up here next time as we continue this series, When Do the Christians Replace Israel? Because you will see that this was strategically done. After the persecution and scattering of our people, the Roman Catholic Church basically inserted itself into our books. They began to create laws and dogmas that made Christianity what it is today. It is a mixture of what the apostles taught with paganism. A little leaven was added and it has corrupted the whole lump. And it's not the doctrine established by Messiah and his apostles. This, uh, this doctrine that we see now provided the framework for the Gentile church to erase Israel. But let's read the scripture to remind ourselves of the promise of our Heavenly Father. This is from Isaiah 43, 1. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. So just remind yourselves of the Most High's promises, family. Remember that he is not slack concerning his promises. Our redemption is near. So be sure to hit like, share, and join me next time. Shalom, everyone.